Celebrating four years of talk like you've never heard it before, this is Gap, the Great American Broadcast Network. Hey everybody, hey there, how are you? This is the Ramble, and if we get callers, we'll go until midnight tonight, Eastern Daylight Time, and if we don't get callers, uh, we'll probably get out of here at 11. <laughs> because uh, uh, this week, a lot of people aren't going to be here, like uh, Rob can't call because he's on vacation, and Patrick can't call because he's uh, having some operation on his, uh, uh, getting some bladder stones removed, and... Um, Phil isn't here tonight, so uh, if I don't have enough people, I just, you know, hell, I've got other things to do with my life, right? Okay. Uh, I'm uh, glad that a lot of you have tuned in. Doesn't look like we have a ton of people watching right now, but if at any time anybody wants to rewatch this, you can go to gabnet.net or you can go to uh, my uh, our YouTube channel um, or you can go to my Facebook page. Uh, and this is the second in a three-part interview that we did with Jack Garfine. Let me explain Jack Garfine for a second just to set this thing up. Jack Garfine, uh, here in America, was a very successful Broadway director, teacher, taught at the Actors Studio and helped start the uh, Actors Studio West in Hollywood, uh, was responsible for the careers of many famous people, including James Dean, uh, he was close with Marilyn Monroe, and those are a lot of stories we want to get to with him if we can get him back into the studio. But when I knew that I could get an interview with my good friend Jack Garfine, and I asked him to do it, and he said he would, I felt we had to start at the beginning, because the beginning was a kind of beginning to his life that uh, I don't know how the rest of us would have turned out, but man, it was a, it was, it was a rough go. Uh, he spent uh, his early years, from age 13 to, I think it was 15, in concentration camps. In fact, he was in 11 of them. And he recounts the stories of that. Next week, it'll be a 50-minute episode in which he recounts all that went on with Auschwitz and beyond and being liberated. But tonight, we continue the story with how it led up to uh, how he led up being led to the concentration camps and how that came about, and he immerses you in his life at that moment as a, in this case, I guess we start, he's about 12 years old, and his sister is nine, and uh, we'll pick it up where we left off, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, Jack Garfine. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I've got to, I've got to do this right. See, I was so welled up in what I had to tell you that I, yeah. Here, ladies and gentlemen, is that interview with Jack Garfine. So where we left off was you, you met up with your mother, did you, in yeah, the forest? Yeah, yeah, and we started the right. crossing. And at what point did you, I mean, at some point you had to get caught, right? Oh, I'll tell you. <laughs> we didn't get caught. It was amazing. First of all, again, children. You realize you don't. Yeah. People always tell horror about the stories, but never about the life. Yeah. So, my mother was very protective of my sister. She was nine years old, so we had to at one point pass a farm where the 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 awful stuff from the cows and the horse were. Yeah. You know. Manure. Manure. Yeah. And she picked up my sister and carried her across. And for me, she said, walk. And I wouldn't walk. And so the people got worried. I said, no, you pick me up. She said, I can't pick you up, you, you know. So one of the people, one of the Jews, came and picked me up and carried me across. And then I felt she was protecting my sister. She preferred her to me, mm -hmm. okay. and. Uh, then at one point, the moment there was a sound, mm -hmm. 
we had to hide. We lay down flat because if the soldiers at the border saw us, they'd kill us. So anyway, uh, I was asked to go at the end of the line because I was the only kid, the boy, and my sister went with my mother holding her mm -hmm. hand. So guess what I did? At one point I stopped. I said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm gonna stay right here. And the, the guy, the, the guy who was leading, the smuggler, said, let's go, we just go. They went, I sat there, and I said, no, I'm staying. And, and so he came back, the smuggler, with my mother and my sister. And he said, now I'll tell you what, I'm gonna count 10. You don't go, you stay right here. And my mother pleaded with me, you know. I said, no, I'm not going, you go with her. In fact, I mean, it shows you under all this, the, yeah. the, you know, the human element, right? Yeah. And so I, um, they left again, because I wouldn't move. Then my mother came back with tears, crying, and told me how much she loved me. And then I went. And we got to the border of Hungary. And there, the smuggler said, okay, now you're on your own. It's pretty clear here, it's only farms, peasants. But dogs will be barking. Don't pay any attention. Just keep running until you get to the other part of the forest and somebody will pick you up over there and take you to your family, okay? So we get to the edge and uh, said, just keep running and don't stop for dogs and don't be worried that the dogs will come and get you. Okay? So we started, we ran and this time my mother held my hand and I even said, no, no, I can make it, you know. And, uh, and we got to the other part of the forest and we were sleeping because it all happened during the night, I mean, me and my sister. And there were terrible mosquitoes that bit us all over. And my mother had to stay up to watch for a carriage, horse and carriage, that was gonna pick us up, you know, to take us mm -hmm. to the city. And so at one point she woke us and said, the horse and carriage is here. We go quietly. So we went. I said, please, the moment it stops, act like you're sleeping. Because we couldn't speak Hungarian. And my mother could speak it. She was worried, mm -hmm. you know. And so we went, we were in the carriage, and he took us to a hotel, okay? And out of the hotel, arrangements were made for us to be taken to the train station the next day, okay? And, uh, and here's the irony. The hotel was owned by a Jew. And in Hungary, the law was for Jews, if you kept refugees, you would be deported with the refugees. He found out that we were Jews. He said, okay, you get out, or else I report you to the police, okay? I mean, look at the peasant woman and look at this guy. Yeah. Uh, and so um, we had to quickly pack, you know, and get in a horse and carriage and get near the railroad station, stay in the carriage until we, the train came. And then we got on the train and both of us, my mother told us, lie down like you're asleep. And because uh, on the train they came to check and she spoke perfect Hungarian. By the way, can I just ask you a second? Where was your father in all of this? My father was still in Hungary. In Hungary, okay. Yeah, in hiding, you know. Yeah. And so, I, uh, so I heard them opening the door, my mother speaking to them, and they didn't seem to wake us, the kids, you know. And, uh, and we arrived in Munkac, where she was born, and.
mm-hmm. my maternal part of the family. My, and there, one of my uncles was there again with horse and carriage and, uh, and drove us to the house to the, in a big hotel. My grandfather owned a big hotel there mm-hmm. and in the back were the living quarters. And we got to the thing and, and my grandmother got emotional. My grandfather said, stop it. You never know who might see something. Just act like it's a normal kind of a visit. And we were all mosquito bitten all over, you know. And so they arranged for us to be in hiding, like Anne Frank, you know, Mm -hmm. in the attic upstairs, they arranged for, you know, because my sister picked up Hungarian pretty quickly, but not me. It took me time, you know, and Mm -hmm. I couldn't be downstairs or anything. And, um, And so we lived in the attic, so you couldn't see where the entrance was. How long were you there? Oh. Almost a year, I think. In the attic? Yeah. But they would feed us, they would take care of us. Well, I know that, but I mean, I yeah, assume yeah. that, but. but, but yeah, yeah. But yeah. in the Maybe attic? Maybe not quite a year, but pretty close. In the attic? Wow. Yeah. And then what happened was one of my uncles, because my mother was born there, and, I, and luckily both of us were born there as well. Both kids were born in, in my mother's town. It was, you know. Now this hotel and the attic were were where again? There was no hotel. This was uh, my the, grandfather's. Okay, his, yeah. his place. The hotel was his. Place. Yeah, uh, but the attic uh, was in his house. And that was where again? In in, in the back. Where but in house. Czechoslovakia? No, no. Oh. This is Hungary. Now, now you're in this Hungary. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. I'm trying to. I'm trying and, to figure um, out the. So you went from Czechoslovakia to Hungary. From Slovakia. Slovakia. Czech didn't exist anymore. Okay. The Germans took Bohemia. Yeah. And so... Uh, um, so how, how did it come to pass? Uh, this is a year now so, in this attic. How did it come to pass that you suddenly got caught? Oh, well, what happened was my uncle got my, our birth certificates, which said that we were born there. Mm-hmm. So, and the idea was that my mother divorced my father and moved back to her hometown. Yeah. But she was, you know, maybe it wasn't a year, maybe it was six months or something. Yeah. And so based on that, we were able to then come downstairs. But any time somebody saw something, we were always immediately hidden because people say, where did the kids come from? You yeah. Know? Never saw them here before. And then... It was time for my bar mitzvah. And uh, my grandfather said, hey, we gotta, I, had to, uh, I had the prophet Isaiah, okay? But you know, there was a lot of sexual stuff going on with the housekeeper in the hotel. And I would always listen and <laughs> the story. And my mother would go after me. And say, I, don't you go near there, though, you know. And so one day I remember uh, I was listening to this guy who had two women and all that. And my mother came in to the other room, but I was listening behind the door. And I said, and I started to recite Isaiah. She said, I'll give you an Isaiah. You, I know what you were doing here. I warned you never to do this, right? Yeah, because I was saying, and God said, if you're unkind to your neighbors, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I still want to get to the, well, how, did, how did you get caught? Well, what happened was that, well, actually you got part of the story yeah. in what I sent you. What happened was that the, uh, uh, the stoop fan, I mean, uh, Elie Wiesel, you know, puts, put himself there as the, the big hero, got the Nobel Prize for helping the Cambodians. The two guys that should get the Nobel, they should have gotten both the Nobel Prize and statues of these two Slovakian boys. Nobody 
ever escaped from Auschwitz. Uh, all electric fences and everything. Because the Nazis knew they didn't want the world to know what was going on, okay? And that was showed you that the rebellion of Jews existed. All underground, they arranged and worked out for these two boys. They wanted them to get out to warn the Hungarian Jews that they are preparing the, everything for them to be killed. That's why they got out, not for themselves. Okay? And you know, when I found out that Wetzler was alive in Bratislava, I went to visit him. I became very close friends with him. I was amazing. And so anyway, so what happened was exactly what you read. We were told because the Russians were winning, Stalingrad was occupied, and they were moving close to the Hungarian border. So what happened was that uh, uh, they were going to uh, uh, deport the Jews because they couldn't be sure of our loyalty, you know, with the Russians coming. And they, but the Hungarians were going to take us to another part of Hungary, you know. To, the Hungarians weren't going along with the concentration Oh, yeah, they were camp. part of the... Oh, they were. Oh, yeah, part okay. of the Nazi alliance. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so... Uh, but they were, not, they were not doing the things because they were independent. They didn't persecute the Jews. Yeah. They didn't do any of uh, my grandfather had his business. In other words, they aligned themselves they aligned themselves with the militarily. Nazis militarily, but so far as uh, hey we're gonna put you know, we're gonna turn over they the didn't Jews have and things any like Jewish that. They, laws, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then what happened was that uh, um, when these two boys escaped Auschwitz, they went and they spoke to the, they got the peasants again, non Jews, hid them. And the Germans offered something like a million marks for the two Jews if they were given up. And the peasants didn't do it. Instead, they got in touch with the nuncio, mm -hmm. the Catholic nuncio. And he came up and they told him the story. And they couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. And he went and told the story to, Pope, to the Pope. And the Pope, who was you know, not the greatest in terms of that. This time he did do a remarkable thing. He got in touch with Roosevelt and Churchill and told them what was happening. And Roosevelt then sent a message to the head of the government. If you deport, the, he was not a fascist. He was, you know, the regular government. If you deport the Jews, you will be held as a criminal, as a war criminal. Well, well, the Germans found out about this whole operation. Well, when they found out about it, Hitler invited the head of the government to come and visit him. And when the guy was on his way to visit him, they occupied Hungary. Mm, okay. Okay. And immediately passed the Nazi laws. Okay? Yeah, the Jewish laws. Jewish, oh, yeah. And uh, so then the idea was that... Uh, uh, we were going to be, but not nothing dangerous. We we're just going to be moved. The Hungarian fascists went along with them. You know, they did all the. This is why we trusted them because they were Hungarians, so we felt it wasn't like the Nazis, and so uh, that's what happened on the first Passover night. Okay, like. My grandfather was in the middle of conducting the Seder, but there was a knock on the door. And one of the non-Jewish friends heard, knew that something was going on. They came to warn him, as they did some other people. Again, individuals, that's what I mean, mm -hmm. see. And uh, there was a frantic rush. Now, my mother had gotten my uncles to prepare the cellar where we could hide at least for a couple of weeks until the Russians came. You know, it was in my uncle's grocery store and was hidden under the ground. And they rushed immediately that night to finish it, to do whatever they could. And the idea was 
that they were going to go the next morning. We were going to hide in the cellar until uh, the Russians came. And um, and then what happened was that <laughs> didn't get, to get to the cellar, you had to go to my uncle's grocery store, which was on the main street. Nobody expected that there would be guys with machine guns on the main street. And my uncle was went out, look, came and said, we can't go, they're gonna kill us. They're right there on the street watching for any Jews doing anything. So we went to the normal cellar. We hid in the normal cellar. And uh, which was, by the way, you were having a Seder. The Seder was completely... What? You were having a Seder, and when these people came to the door... We stopped the Seder. You stopped the Seder. The stay Seder never got we finished. We started packing. We started packing for the next day. And um, so uh, what happened was that the Jews were told all to meet in the square, in the synagogue, in the yard of the synagogue and from there we were going to go to the ghetto and uh, we were in the cellar mm -hmm. but we were insecure because the porter who worked for the hotel I'm sure there was a feeling that he wanted to take the hotel so we saw a shadow go by all the time by the door the, the, the leading to the, to the cellar so we decided to try to take a risk to send one of the kids to go to the synagogue yard to see what's going on. And uh, I volunteered, but because of my background, and, and my cousin was the same age, but the youngest one, his name was Getzel. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful little boy. I go, nobody's gonna catch me. He's eight years old. Nobody's gonna do anything. Don't worry, I'm, I'll, I'll do it. So they told him, now listen, don't worry. If you don't come back within two hours, we all leave and we go to the yard, because then we'll know you're in trouble, okay? So we're not gonna abandon you. So he leaves, and we told that when he comes back to be careful that nobody notices him, he's to throw some mm -hmm. little stones to them. Yeah. And so we're waiting, and he comes back, little stones, and his brother goes and opens the door. What's, what's happening? Well. The tailor next to us was in hiding. They shot him and his family. That unless you come out into the yard, they're gonna go through every building and whoever they find hiding, everybody gets killed, okay? My mother was still wanted to take a risk, but her sister-in-law with Rella, my cousin that I was in love with, mm -hmm. um, she, was terrified. She said, no, no, I'm taking the kids, I'm going out. So we decided, okay, we all go out because we knew if she was grasped or something, they'd torture her and they'd find out where we were. So my mother said, okay. So we all go to the ghetto and we went, we were lucky because my uncle had a house mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So all of us could sleep in the attic. Right. So we went up to the attic and with mattresses and stuff and stayed there. And then the Hungarian leadership assured us that we not to worry. We're going to Hungary. The Hungarians are taking care of it. We're going to to place where just to escape the Russians. Mm -hmm. No Nazis were involved. But of course, then we heard the story that Eichmann, you know, mm -hmm. who was a killer of all, the, you know, in charge, you know, was in Budapest. He was the architect of the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, when the two boys escaped and word got to the Jews in Budapest, what was happening, they confronted him. They confronted Eichmann. They said, what is this we hear? So then he guaranteed, as I wrote to you, your families will not be touched if you shut up, if you don't say anything. So they did, they never said anything. They kept assuring us mm -hmm. that, and the guy was the head, 
Kastner yeah. was the head of it after after Israel was established. Yeah. He moved to Israel and of course they took him to court and the court there acquitted him. They felt, well, yeah. the war. But let, let's, oh, wait, let me finish. Yeah, okay. What happened is one day he's walking down the street. Yeah. Guy comes up and kills him. <laughs> anyway, how did you get caught? That's, how did you get caught? That's, you know, uh, how did you and your family get captured and sent away to a camp? Well, we, because we were in the cellar, we went to the ghetto. Mm -hmm. The ghetto was completely closed off. And, um, and from the ghetto, we were taken to a brick factory because trains could go in there. And that's where the cattle cars came. I see. So yeah. once, you, once you moved into the ghetto area, yeah, you kind we of didn't it was know. like it was we like thought, you walked into a prison. We thought we were, yeah, we thought yeah. we were being taken to Hungary. Even my grandfather was a brilliant man, all that believed yeah. that we would, because it was 1944, the Nazis were losing, Stalingrad was gone, uh, they, they didn't need any more trouble or problems. Right. You know, my mother was the only one. What are your remembrances of the cattle car? What? What are your remembrances of the cattle car? the cattle car well first of all um, I wanted as a kid I wanted to run away mm -hmm. and I wanted my mother to find a way so we would run away yeah and uh, and she said if they get us they'll kill us all this way I'll never forget this story. talking to a 12 year old this way, one of us might survive, never know. But the other way, they kill us all. So we just go along in case somebody gets saved. So, get in a cattle car, 80 people in a cattle car. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, <laughs> and my mother was the only one with a sense of humor because when the, uh, uh, Jewish policemen came to the cattle car. They announced that there were two big, uh, you know, you know, one of the things in the army that they carry the food, the big uh, kettles. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well. He said, "There's one here for the men, one there for the women. So if you need to go, you go." And those. And my mother said, "And how about some toilet paper?" And everybody laughed, and, you know, but she always tried to <laughs> find a way to, you know. And, um, and then, so what happened was uh, that uh, my grandfather, who, were, who was knowledgeable about the territory, so uh, what happened was he always kept looking out. There were wires on the window, on the window, the opening of the cabin. Yeah. And so he kept looking out all the time. And, and at one point, he turned into the car, I'll never forget this, and he broke down crying. And what happened to my mother? We just crossed into Poland. Meaning, no, excuse me, sorry, we, no. First, he said, we crossed into Bohemia. And in Bohemia, the Hungarian soldiers left and the SS took over, mm -hmm. right? And then he saw through the window that we went into Poland. And he knew about stories that happened in Poland, mm -hmm. people to kill them there, you know? And he broke down and he felt it was his fault. That he should have known, he should have seen, you know? Anyway, uh, uh, so then we, my mother took over standing at the window to watch where we were going. Now what happened was, at, I was then 13, mm -hmm. my cousin Rella was 12, and a romance started between us, and so I said, you know, we had a marriage ceremony. We were hiding in a cellar, 
and her father had a bar, so she brought some wine, and we had a ceremony that we were married. And then she went. I said, well, now I have to break. Legally married? What? Legally married? Well, the two of us, I was 13, she was 12. Uh, was this like a pretend uh, wedding? We said, this, we imitated. Well, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> and so. It was your first brush with in theater. The, in the <laughs> wedding, in a, in, a, in a wedding, you break the glass so nobody. Right. So I went and broke the glass. She picked up all the shreds. She said, no, no, I'm going to save this. I don't want this to disappear. And then she said to me, but how will, how will you know that I'm your wife? I, I can't have a ring because people suspect. She said, oh, I know. Whenever you look at me and I go like this, you'll know mm -hmm. that I'm, I, it's like a ring, mm -hmm. okay? So family started to suspect something was going on. And my mother took me and warned me never again to see my cousin alone with her, you know. And uh, even though there was a Jewish school, mm -hmm. I was not to go anywhere near her. And because what happened was uh, she went home, at, at one point went home, and she was bleeding. So her mother called the doctor, it was her first period that she had, right? The doctor said it wasn't the first period. Someone tried to penetrate, and then they kept us always apart. In the ghetto, the first thing they did, she was on one end, I was on the other, mm -hmm. right? And we, in the middle of the night, we would get up and right. wave to each other, you know. Now, let's get back to the cattle car. To the one? To the cattle car. Where did it wind up? This is, so wait, so, oh no, what happened was when we went to the brick factory. Okay. Okay, so we were, the whole family, our family, plus others, there were 80 of us mm -hmm. in the cattle car. And oh, even there, the first thing was to keep me and my cousin apart. That's what my oh, daughter, okay. my daughter is called Rella, yeah. after her, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, it's to keep us apart. Now, we suddenly arrive at a place in the middle of the night and uh, my mother looks out oh no before the middle of the night early evening yeah she sees men and women with uniforms you know with uh, striped prison uniforms mm -hmm. with shovels going to work because the others still believed that we're going to a labor camp it's going to be a labor camp yeah my mother looked out and she saw this. And I intuitively went to Rella's mother and asked her, could I sleep next to Rella? And the mother looked at my mother and said to her, he asks her that he can sleep. I'll never forget. My mother turned her head and went like that. Mm. Right? So I slept next to her made love to her for the first time. And I even said to her, now you're a real woman, you know. And probably she may have even gotten pregnant, who knows. Anyway, the next morning, we hear them. Was that, the, that, was that your first time? What? Was that yeah. your first time? Yeah. Wow. The next morning, you hear them coming close to the cattle car. And uh, my mother, unlike in Nazi fucking Holocaust movies, Auschwitz, ah, eh, brushed my sister's hair, straightened out my sweater, made sure that we looked good, that, you know, we're coming to a place. And then, you know, she was so amazing. She says, now listen, you have an uncle in America. His name is Joe, Joe Garfine. So just remember, because we never know, what might happen? Now she says this to a 12-year-old, right, and a nine-year-old kid, right? The others were all telling their kids, don't worry, everything is fine. You'll be going to work. And she was always telling us what was really happening and what could be happening. And so the doors open, big lights on, and they're yelling, okay, get out. 
leave the bags on the side of the train. They will all be delivered to you. The next morning, they're all marked. You will all have your bags. Okay? So, we left, we get off, and they're hitting people who are not. And then there's the couples. Those are the Jews who yeah. are working kind of as guards. Yeah. Yeah. The only ones that would never do it were the Greek Jews. Even though they were threatened with going into the gas chamber, they said, it's fine, we go. They wouldn't be couples, they wouldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Anyway. What, now, where are you now? What camp is what camp is this? Auschwitz. This is Auschwitz. Yeah. Why don't we stop right there? What? Why don't we stop right there and we'll pick okay, it up? Okay. okay? And that's uh, the second of the three interviews we did with Jack Garfine. Uh, I know sometimes it's a little difficult to to uh, understand what he's saying because uh, he's older and his recollections are uh, not as, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, they're not, the, they're, they're, they're not as, as even as you would like them to be. But anyway, the point I'm making is is that I hope you got something out of that because, you know, I mean, the first time this guy ever made love to someone was in a cattle car on his way to Auschwitz. I mean, it, it's uh, just amazing stories he has to tell. But, you you know, it takes some taking, some listening to. So you don't, you don't, you know, you, you have to... Uh, and I noticed that our listenership was not huge on this. Uh, and I'm not uh, sorry about that. Uh, I'm, I'm a little surprised and disappointed. But maybe we'll see what the uh, listenership is like on the replays. People may um, stick around for that. Uh, next week, on Wednesday, we finish with a 50-minute segment of this interview in which he tells us all about what it's like in Auschwitz in the concentration camps and his liberation and uh, it uh, it it is the mo of all the three the most compelling interview and uh, 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 and then after that I'm going to post a um, uh, I don't know depending upon how I feel uh, I have a two-hour, rather an hour and fifty-minute version of the of the interview. It's the complete interview all at once uh, that I am going to put up, but I don't know where I'm going to put it up yet. Uh, probably on YouTube, uh, maybe over on the Facebook page, but I doubt it. Uh, and uh, it's definitely going to go up on Roku with my uh, with Gabnet and Gabnet Law, uh, Gabnet TV. Uh, so um, uh, that will be something you can also uh, do and point friends to and say, hey, I heard this interview and you want to hear the whole thing, listen to it. But that will be available after next week's show. Uh, so anyway, well, let's say we don't have any callers. Uh, this is a night that I'm, I'm worried we're not going to have any. And sometimes when I'm worried about that, we get a lot of callers. And then uh, sometimes we don't get any callers at all. So... Anyway, I'm going to sit here and wait and see if anybody uh, calls. We don't have uh, Tony, uh, we don't have uh, Phil tonight. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, Patrick tonight. We don't have uh, uh, Rob tonight. Rob and Patrick, Rob, Rob is on vacation. Patrick is in the hospital uh, getting his uh, uh, stones removed gets kidney stones every now and then and they got to deal with those and um, otherwise he's uh, uh, you know and then uh, uh, Phil is out with some Mishigas about his photography I don't know what it, what's, what it is it's another one of his photographic meetings that he goes to so anyway we're waiting for people to call and if they don't call by by 11 or we don't get a decent amount by 11 I'll just call it quits for tonight but you know I can only you know what I can always do? I can always count on Tom Yamaguchi. Uh, whenever I say I need calls tonight, there's Tom. Hi, Tom. 
How are you? Hey there. Yeah. Well, what a story. What a, what an amazing story. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, last week I actually missed the beginning of it. So when uh, I came in, I got was you know was having trouble understanding where what was happening, and so I actually uh, went to the next day uh, from the beginning. Yeah. And and, and, and listened from the beginning, and uh, yeah, it, it it a lot makes sense, but it it, it takes a lot of effort to really focus on it because as you said his memories are are not complete and he sort of wanders well, his, and his, you're not really sure it's strange. where things are and when and you have to you have to really pay attention actually his memories are good the problem is is that as at his age he's a little scattered in the telling of them you know he will jump from here to there back to there mm -hmm. forward and the, the job that I had there and why it was a difficult interview for me to do outside of the subject matter was getting him to go kind of in a straight line and, and keeping him moving ahead and, mm -hmm. uh, and yet not ruin the interview by doing that. Right, yeah, you know? yeah. You, you don't want to have totally lose his concentration, forget where right. he was, you know. <laughs> Next week gets very focused. Because he's at the camps, and then, so we get a really real idea of what the camps are like. And in it, I ask a question that I've always wanted to ask a concentration camp survivor, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I've ever heard this question asked by anybody before, mm -hmm. and he had an answer for me. And it's a tip, oh. it's a kind of question I would ask, you know. Uh, how hello, how are you this uh, fine evening, Jeff? Good, good. Well, that beard what? just gets that beard just gets handsomer and handsomer. You do you take good care. You must take good care of it. I tried to, you know, I tried to grow the beard. I, I've given up. Just given really? up. Really? Yeah. I I have to trim it a lot. Really? So yeah, you're very hair suit. I tend to. What happens right. here? It it doesn't all come in. It's kind of like you know, kind of weird. So you got, you're going to become a, a, a beard trimmer yeah. <laughs> yourself. You know? did, did you hear any of the interview with Jack tonight? Yeah. Yeah. I, I heard all of it. What? what? And, and uh, I enjoyed it again. And uh, as I expected the, the day before, um, I'm very familiar with uh, the Holocaust. Yeah. I probably read more more than 10 books about it yeah. as, as I was growing up. And, uh, and some of our family were, were in the Holocaust, too. Very few of them, obviously. For, uh, but a lot of them left after World War I yeah. and came to the United States. But some of them stayed, and some of them hid. And... Uh, one of my uh, cousins, she was a very pretty blonde lady, and uh, everybody thought she was not Jewish. Mm -hmm. So she just faked the whole thing, mm -hmm. and she but she survived because of that. She's she's uh, she's not no longer alive, but she was a pretty uh, lady. Yeah, but. Uh, his stories as being a child at that level it's 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 unbelievable yeah, we do hear you're right we do hear from a lot of adults telling stories of what it was yeah. like in the concentration camps but we never hear from children particularly you know i mean uh, either they were too young to remember the whole thing in most cases if they were children if they were under 13 they were usually uh, you know killed uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you'll find out how he doesn't get killed uh, because yeah. his mother tells him to lie about something. So. Yeah, one of the one of the uh, very demanding book that I read many years ago was about a teenager who was probably in Poland when when uh, when they shrunk right. the Polish Jewish uh, what, what do they call that a, a segment. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and because of that, they were really starving. Yeah. Because they had no source of food. So here's this little 
16 year old or a 15 year old, I forget, maybe he's a 12 year old. And he used to know how to get through the tunnels and under the water and in the sewage systems and go out and bring money and, and get food and bring it back. Mm-hmm. And, and he'd go back and forth and back and forth. It was an amazing story for, for a child. Yeah, well, I oh but look, kept look. thousands of people alive or hundreds. Look who's calling! Amazing, Patrick. I didn't think we were going to hear from you this week, Patrick. Yeah, I didn't either. But I have a uh, four o'clock pickup from the cripple van to take me to the hospital, and I'm not going <laughs> to bed. So I figured I'd call in to just keep me awake, and you know, mm-hmm. four hours is only what. Five hours. Do they, do, they act, do, they, five hours. do they actually call it the cripple van? No, no. That's, that's what I call it. <laughs> I think I remember you said that before. I, <laughs> if I remember correctly, you hate terms like uh, physically disabled or whatever, you know, the, the gratuitous terms. People. Huh? Anything, anything PC, like differently able, is horse shit to me. Yeah, if yeah. If you're crippled or disabled, you are disabled because you cannot. You are unable. So, so don't try to pretend. Like, you never mm-hmm. minded me referring to you as a gimp. No. 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 See, you know, the only thing I won't do for you is put a ball gag in my mouth. Well, no, I didn't expect you to do that, and I would not do that to you. That's demeaning. <laughs> well, I'll put the latex on, but I won't do the ball game. I see. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> nipple clamps are okay. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, no, I, what I've always liked about you, Patrick, is your attitude is, I think, the attitude people should have. I mean, some people have a disability, and they use it. You know what I'm saying? They, they, they try to use it as a uh, as though it has cash value you know uh hey i'm crippled you can't do that to me help me across the street i'm crippled you know you're the kind of guy who just goes fuck you i'll i'll, I'll make it i'll i'll do it by myself you know you don't have to help me uh, i remember years ago uh there was this jazz musician i've mentioned the story before uh, named George Shearing, who loved to tell the stories about how people would try to help him on the bus and almost rip his <laughs> arm out of his socket, mm-hmm. you know, and he'd yeah. have to tell them, please, I can do it for myself, you know, I've learned how to find the stairs and so on in a, uh, in a bus. And he, said, and he said the worst thing about his life was that people were too helpful, you know. Well, they didn't know how to help. I mean, basically what you do is you ask somebody. Yeah. Do you need some assistance? And if the person is blind, you can offer your elbow and let them hold on to your elbow. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and uh, you notice that with, uh, you know, Bill Cosby. Right. Uh, when he was going to the courthouse, yeah. his lawyer or whatever was offering his elbow so that Cosby could, could hold on to it. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Uh, although nobody seems to feel sorry for Bill Cosby. And, uh, and well, I, <laughs> Patrick, it's difficult. I mean, you know, his, his, at his age, I mean, you know, what what are you going to do? I he's mean, you know, that, he's, he's not, not going to. If you send him to, to prison, he's not going to be there very he's long. He's not that old. I think he's my age. I think he's like seventy eight or seventy nine, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. I think of it. He looks a lot older. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That's he's old. Really in bad shape. I, 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 Shut the fuck up, Jeff. I know it's old. No, I, I mean he doesn't. He looks like someone much older than you are. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know he does, but a part of that is, uh, you know, his inability to walk by himself, and they have to, you know, have people drag him along. Yeah, but I just use that as an illustration of how to assist people with disabilities. Yeah. I think the most yeah. useless thing anybody did was that woman about a week ago who streaked him uh, at uh, the uh, court house because he couldn't take advantage of seeing it, you know. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, what, what was being topless? What did that have to do with Bill Cosby? In fact, you would probably want to wear a burqa around Bill Cosby. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I didn't understand that at all. 
Yeah. Uh, did you hear any of the interview with Jack uh, Patrick? Oh, yeah. 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 Matt, um, uh, one of the things I was going to say when I came on was um, I, when I was a kid, I was introduced to a gentleman who um, he ran a uh, small grocery store near my grandparents' house. It was right on the corner. Mm -hmm. And he was Jewish. And he was in one of the concentration camp. I don't know which one, with his family. Yeah. And he was the only survivor. And he had told stories to my grandparents. And one of his most vivid memories was watching his father get shot and then watching, having to watch his mother and sister get raped and have their breasts cut off hey. and then shot. And so you were talking from a kid's perspective. Well, he was only, you know, maybe right around Jack's age, you know, um, a young teenager or preteen. Mm -hmm. And those are the memories he had just getting at the camp. And then he survived and went on, you know, he came to America and, and um, yeah. lived, I think, almost into his 80s. Um, and pretty reasonable life, but pretty horrific beginning to life. Yeah. You know, um, you know it, it uh, as I said about a week ago when I first ran the first interview, that what makes this all so exceptional is that there aren't a lot of people alive to tell the story anymore, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, to begin with, uh, yeah. uh, there were the ones that died in the camps, but a a a absent that, uh, the ones who lived after the war, of which there were many, 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 most of them are gone now. They're old. They died. You know, mm -hmm. Jack is, and he was in when he was uh, 13 years old, when he finally wound up at the camp, and uh, he's, what, he's 87 now. You know, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. Patrick. I I wonder if it isn't unlike a lot of military veterans who have been through combat that they just didn't talk about it with anybody either. You know, where it was a select few people that they would talk to. And now, mm -hmm. just like the World War II generation is basically gone mm -hmm. yeah, and then world war one generation and vietnam they are aging um and you know a lot of people they don't discuss what happened i think a lot of i would assume a lot of concentration camp survivors yeah. same thing I mean, the horrors and that why relive it um yes uh tom yeah actually i was thinking the same thing i was thinking of the uh the Ken Burns uh, World War II documentary, a lot of the motiv motivation of his, that he had was the fact that these were people who were not going to be alive much longer, and they haven't told their stories. And unfortunately, a lot of the reasons why they hadn't told their stories is the experience was so traumatic. They came back and they they didn't want to they didn't want to talk about it. It took a lot for the, you know a lot of time to go by for them to realize that. It was probably important for them to talk about what they experienced for 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 history's sake. Well, you know, it, I it, would say the same thing for for the Holocaust survivors it, too. I mean, it, it is really important, and 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 also, you know, in Germany for many years, um, they didn't talk about it. Uh, they didn't teach in the schools. I had a um, when I was in San Diego, I was I had a coworker who was an immigrant from Germany, and. Uh, they had a ABC miniseries on the Holocaust. And the next day he came to work and he says, I can't believe this. You know, this was my country. And no, we never talked. We I never told me about this in, in school. And he was just totally shocked. He never heard uh, how horrible it was. Uh, by the way, I, I just want to take time out mm -hmm. to say we could use some more callers here. And I don't know why we don't have anybody. I always get very suspicious the signal isn't going out when I don't see anything in the chat. Because the chat is usually going like crazy, and mm -hmm. there's nothing there tonight. So I don't, I don't know if there's a problem out there. 
Uh, the numbers watching are kind of low, but I'm getting a picture here, and so that means that everybody else should be getting a picture everywhere else. So I have no idea what the mm-hmm. what the problem yeah. is. Uh, it, to, to not be kind of trivial about this, but a good example of what you're talking about is there was a great series that was done uh, circa 1970s, maybe maybe 80s. Oops. We just lost Jeff, uh, called Hollywood the Pioneers. And it was all about the silent film era. And they had a lot of people they were interviewing in this thing who had been stars of the silent era and Mm -hmm. uh, talked about the silent era. Uh, And uh, all those people people are dead now. They're gone. There's not a one of them left, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Uh, So so there are certain documentaries that you want to do that you can't do because there's, you know, if I did a thing, I want to do a thing on, on what happened to Jeff? Oh, there he is. Okay. Uh, uh, if I want to do a thing on silent films today, I couldn't find anybody who was in silent films or who worked in silent films to talk about it. Mm-hmm. So thank God this guy, Kevin Brownlow and David Gill went out and did this series mm-hmm. because all those people are gone. Right. And, and you really can't do a real documentary about the Holocaust right now because most of the people who were victims of the Holocaust are gone. You know, or, or well, the victims are gone. They were always gone before. But the, the people who were part of that and lived through it uh, mm-hmm. are, you know, are pretty much gone. You're, you're mm-hmm. going to have a hard time finding them. Yeah. Yes, Patrick. <clears throat> I watched a documentary... Uh, I think it may have been Saturday night on the SS, and they had interviewed um, a number of SS guards, um, mm. and some of these interviews went back into the 90s because the guys had died already, mm-hmm. but some of them who were recruited much like in the Hitler Youth, where they were just, that was it, or they were drawn to the elite of just being an SS um, guard, not necessarily a guard, but in the SS, and Mm -hmm. then they didn't realize what the hell was going on when they were then stationed at concentration camps. And um, I found that interesting, that some of these guys, the remorse that they had versus a few of them that they interviewed who still attended white power rallies or um, Nazi rallies, and they they lived in Argentina or, or in South America yet, mm-hmm. and they still believed in the cause. Yeah. So that was just bizarre to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See that. But, I mean, to find people today, I mean, like, it, it, you know, Jack was my, my only chance, you know, and I did have the opportunity in the past of talking to people who... I talked to a bunch. Uh, I I knew a bunch of people who were the resistance in World War II, Jewish mm-hmm. resistance uh, in France, uh, and also uh, elsewhere as well. Uh, that I should have interviewed, and I just never did it. You know, mm-hmm. I, I had a little videotape recorder at the time, black and white one. I could have gone around and done interviews with them, and I just never did it. And I always felt very guilty about that. I felt I'd missed a real opportunity by not doing that. And I think part of it, there was certain laziness on my part. I think the other part of it was that the topic was something I didn't want to have to deal with at the time. It was just too... But I I would sit around at Passover dinner, and these people weren't particularly religious, but they would do Passover. They had their their own service, which was less religious and more like a story of freedom and liberation, okay? And they would sit around afterwards and tell these stories, these amazing stories about, you know, what they did in the war and how they killed people and, you know, the, the Nazis and and people who would sneak people out of the country, out of France. And uh, my, uh, my uh, who became my father-in-law, uh, wound up in Russia uh, and was named the head of the Jewish state in exile and then put in Lubyanka prison. <laughs> you know, I mean, 
uh, stories like that. And, and, and it was, and my, my, my wife's mother, uh, Susan's mother, um, uh, uh, she was the least Jewish looking one of the bunch. And they all went to Spain because Franco said he would take Jews as mm -hmm. long as they didn't stay there too long because he couldn't, he couldn't take the crush. But for some reason, he saved a million Jewish lives. Francisco mm -hmm. Franco, who was a terrible person, but for some reason, he loved the Jews. And uh, she, they, they, they left and they went to Spain. And he said to her, but we left all our jewelry in Paris. So she got on a train armed with fake passports and everything, and went back to Paris to get the jewelry uh, because she didn't look Jewish. So uh, stories like that, you know, and you go, God, I missed out. I'm put in literally getting codifying these stories. I could show these to you today, you know. Yes, uh, Tom. Yeah, actually, uh, you uh, reminded me actually a story. Um, a few years ago, I did some work for a man who was a uh, uh, psychology professor at uh, Stanford, although he lived just a few blocks from UC Berkeley. Yeah. Um, but he and his family actually escaped. And I, I vaguely remember the story. He just told it to me once. But um, the idea is they were getting out of, you know, of, of, of uh, Eastern Europe and, uh, where they were going to, the stipulations they couldn't bring anything with it, just the clothes on their back. They couldn't bring any of this, any of this, the valuables and the the jewels and all. Yeah. So he's, and he was eight, nine, something like that at the time, and maybe not much different in age from from Jack Garfield. But his father, he had a toy ball, and he put all the jewels in the toy ball, and he had him bouncing the ball and then when they got to the checkpoint they were checking him the ball suddenly went across the border and he went over to get it and they just let him through <laughs> they didn't check the ball and they got all the family jewels out of the out of the country <laughs> Well, as I said, there's a question that I ask on next week's show, which is something I always wanted to ask, and and you'll you'll be able you'll you'll understand it the minute you hear it. You'll know it was the one that I was waiting to ask, um, because it fascinates me that you know I I got to tell you to begin with I had we had lunch with Jack and Natalia on uh, Saturday, and Saturday um, or Sunday, excuse me, Sunday. And Sunday was the 15th of, um, of April, which mm -hmm. is the exact day that he was liberated. Wow. And he was depressed. I mean, mm. object, uh, uh, abject depression. And I said to him, why are you depressed? And he said, because this is the day I was liberated. And I, was, I said, I would think that would be a happy day for you. You know, mm -hmm. the, you know uh, you'll, you'll find out how close he came to dying, okay? But they got him before he died. So I, I, I said, you know, you would, it was the beginning of a whole new life for you and, and freedom and, and not having to live with this oppression. And he said, yeah, but that's the time when you find out that everybody you know is gone and uh -huh. you're the survivor. You know, he said, and they started breaking down crying at dinner, at, at lunch rather. And just saying, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I, I lost everything there. Here was a guy who, if you listen to the story, had a very closely knit family. They were small, you know, brother and mm -hmm. sister, but, and mother and father, but they were clo uh, uh, tightly knit, all right? With the mother being, she, I mean, she was amazing, you know, some of the things he says about her and the way in which she dealt with the children in this situation. Uh, and the father, of course, went away to try and fight this whole thing. Um, but uh, uh, they were a tightly knit family. And so to then come on the other side of this and find out that, hey, you don't have a sister anymore and you don't have a brother and you don't have this woman you first had sex with in the cattle car going to Auschwitz. That's what I found absolutely <laughs> an amazing story. 
because mm-hmm. even in the dire moments of something like this, a guy's got to get laid. You know, I mean, I just, I, it was just, <laughs> but I mean, he was in love with her too. They were in love with each other and it was, it was a wonderful thing. And, and uh, that was the last he ever saw of her. You know, I mean, that, that, it, so I, I began to understand why he was so depressed about the day he got liberated. But I would think, like you're, you know, you always every year s- celebrate, Patrick, the day you became a cripple, you know, mm. because, you know, and in this case, here was some reason for him to celebrate. He no longer was a captive of the Nazis. And yet, just unbelievably depressed. And in fact, I, I gave Natalia the, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a web address that she can go to and watch the whole hour and 50 minute version. And she says, I haven't watched it yet. And I said, why? She said, I've been going the last couple of weeks, I've been going through this whole uh, uh, Holocaust thing. She said, and it's so depressing that I need relief from it because, mm-hmm. because Passover, which just a couple of weeks ago, was the night that they were arrested. Mm. You know, so all these touchstones of days have come up in a very short period of time every year for him. Mm-hmm. And uh, as she says, it, it, it gets worse every year because as he gets older, I, and I asked him in the last interview, I'm not spoiling anything, you know, you seem to be more depressed today than you maybe would have been 30 years ago. And he said, yeah. He said, it's just when you get older, you start these things really start to come back to you. You know, the rest of the, I think it's the rest of the time of your life, you're too busy with your career and doing this thing and doing that thing. And then all of a sudden when you're older, you know, you, I sit home here a lot of times just reflecting. I think uh, 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 Jeff, who's a youngster compared to me, uh, probably you reflect a lot, right? On, on the things that were good and the things that were bad. Far more than you ever do when you're working and you're doing your thing and you're trying to get a career going. So I was I was amazed that it was that uh, that uh, that it's become that bad for him right now. And she says it gets worse for him every year. Yes, Jeff. Oh, your your mic isn't on. Did you? you I'm on. There, there you go. Here I am. Um, the reason that I think a lot of people are not listening today that mm-hmm. they could is they find it to be uh, too depressing. And, and and it's a story that, quite frankly, a lot of people just don't want to hear it. Well, the last from, week, I don't know, I'll have to see what happens on the replay. The replay got well, uh, a lot of views, incredible amount of views. So mm-hmm. I, it might happen again this week that that's what happens. They just don't pick it up live. They listen to it later on. We'll mm-hmm. see. It'll be interesting to see. Um, yes, Patrick. I was just <clears throat> thinking that you were talking about uh, saying that you know, it, it's more depressing than, than a positive thing the day that he was liberated. It just reminds me of some of the things that I've, I've talked to veterans about mm-hmm. um, that you know, after a battle is finished, you would think that that would be a relief, but that's when you find out who's been injured, who's been killed, that sort of thing, because when you're in the heat of battle or when you're in the camps and things are going on and you're not aware of what's going, you know, who's where and what, yeah. whenever it stops and there's a calm, that's when everything sets in. Yeah. So, you know, it... it I, I understand that aspect of it, and as far as it's too depressing of a topic, tough shit. That's history, you know, and people need need to hear it. And um, you know, it it better to hear it from somebody like Jack, with you interviewing him, mm-hmm. than anything that you can watch on PBS or or anything like that. You know, I mean, it's not that those aren't real, but like I told you last week, these little tangents that Jack goes off on, mm-hmm. it's more real, at least for me. It, it's almost as if 
I'm there while you're interviewing him versus watching, you know, uh, Katie Couric interview somebody. Well, you know, I've spent a lot of time with Jack over the last year. I, I, I just looked, and it turns out I met him last June for the first time. It's been that short an amount of time. But in that amount of time, I've, I've you know, been with him enough to hear a lot of stories and he recounts the the the, the uh, concentration camp stories to me on many occasions, and many times I act like they're fresh to me because sometimes they're not fresh at all. But occasionally, there's a new little nuance in the story that adds a little more to, to the jigsaw puzzle, you know. And so I went into this interview trying to get some of those spaces filled, and I wanted to know. You know, I'd heard about, hey, here's what it was like at Auschwitz and this and that, and, blah, 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 and you'll hear all the stuff next week. But I wanted to know, you know, what was it like growing up? And then all of a sudden, slowly, this thing starts happening. You know, and you're a kid, and you don't know what's happening. You don't completely understand it, you know. And that thing last week where he talks about his sister, when they said, you know, don't, you know, uh, uh you know, don't tell him you're a Jew. And she goes, look, I was I was born a Jew. I've lived as a Jew. I'll die as a Jew. And that's out yeah. of a nine-year-old kid. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, um, there's a certain, and the mother, the stories about the mother, I mean, as he was telling him tonight, how she would chastise him and tell him, don't do this and don't do that. You're going to get us killed, you know. And, and that she was always very honest with him. Hey, look, we're going somewhere where we're not. We may not live. We may die right. from this. He, the, she kept the reality, the, the, them with the reality of what was happening to them. And I think that was a very brave mother. You mm -hmm. know? All the other mothers were probably sheltering their kids. Oh no, we're going to Clownland, you know, or something <laughs> like that. You know, to kind of keep Life them is beautiful. Keep them quiet, yeah. But the mother never for one moment believed they were going to a happy work camp, you know, right. as, yeah. as the Nazis were trying to portray it. Otherwise, why do they throw you in a cattle car with two buckets to shit in, you know? Right. Um, but, uh, you, you know, you wonder, you wonder a lot about how people just passively went. And I think a lot of them went because they believed that nothing terrible was going to happen to them. How could somebody who runs a government, do this to a group of people. And then when they get there, it's too late to change your mind. You know, it's too late to get out of it. Yes, right. Patrick. Have you seen the movie uh, The Boy in the, in the Striped Pajamas? God, uh, you know something? I avoided that movie because it looked really depressing. <laughs> it, it is. And, and let me tell you, it is an excellent film. And there is a point in there without giving anything away where one of the characters who is not becomes aware of what is actually going on mm -hmm. around them. It, it just it changes the perspective. Yeah. What is and, that what is that noise? What's that banging? Oh. That's probably my wife. Oh. <laughs> she, the, that, that kitchen around those pots and pans. Yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. That's fine. But, I would encourage you to see it, Alan. It, it, I'm trying to remember. Yeah. What, yeah, I'm trying to remember what it's about. It's it's about some Nazi kids or something, and they don't. There's a kid who is Jewish who's in the striped pajamas. Did he escape? He escapes or something. <laughs> There is a Jewish boy who is in a concentration camp, and then there is a boy who is the son of a Nazi officer. Yeah. And yeah. they become friends. Yeah. But the story is much deeper than that. Mm -hmm. And it, I avoided it for what it came out, I think, in 2008, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And a friend of mine kept pounding me on the head to watch it, and I finally did. And it just, it's really an amazing film. Well, you know, uh, uh, Jack became a movie director and uh, became a, a stage director, more more successful as a stage director than a movie director, because when he went to Hollywood, he couldn't put up with Hollywood very well. Mm -hmm. um, 
but he made two very important films. And he, um, you know, he always says to me, constantly, he says, I don't like the Hollywoodization of the Holocaust. You know, mm. it, 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 none of it is, is real, and it always, they always in some way have to have a happy ending of sorts. Even Schindler's List tries to kind of have a happy ending. And he says, there was no happy ending there. That was not a happy ending. There's nothing that's happy ending, you know? He said, there's no movie you could make with a happy ending about the concentration camps. And if you do, you know, I mean, Life is Beautiful. Remember that film, the Italian film yeah. with Roberto Benigni? Um, in a way, even though the guy finally dies at the end and all that, it has kind of a, a, a blissful ending. You know? Well, because the kid escapes. Yeah, yeah. The kid gets away. I wouldn't say it's happy ending. I, I would say, especially with Schindler's List, it's, it's certainly, I, I think they, they want to uh, have an inspirational ending. In other words, to, you know, have something like, well, no, well, yeah, well because he did, they, he was honored, uh, a non Jewish person honored in Israel. And I, you know, I mean, that's sort of. You know, uh, I mean, Schindler. Well, no, the, the Schindler story is an important story, uh, but it's an important story. And I'll get to Patrick in a second. I see the hand up, so I don't want you to have to lose all feeling to your arm before <laughs> tomorrow morning. Uh, is that uh, Schindler, I think there was, a, there was a missed portrayal there of Schindler, that sometimes some people become unintentional heroes you know like they didn't really plan it what he planned to do was make a lot of fucking money but in the process he managed to save a lot of jewish lives part of it was to try and save his company you know get what i'm saying so he becomes an unintentional hero he saved uh, i don't know how many hundreds of lives because he had them come work for him and he shielded them but Part of that was his, 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 initially was his greed, but then that turned into being a, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it, it turned into heroism, turned into making him a hero. So I... Are you, are you saying that uh, Spielberg was being dishonest? I don't think uh, Spielberg knows how to be honest as a filmmaker. I, I think oh. that he is the perfect example of if you can't be sincere, then fake it. Mm. Uh, I think he does not have a real touch with sincerity. Okay, and never has in any film he's ever made. He tries, you know, and in Schindler's List, he did a good job of faking it, but it still is, at the end, becomes a Spielberg movie ending. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yet, uh, Jeff, and then, uh, didn't Patrick well, have his hand up first? Patrick. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Patrick. You. Well, um, what I was going to say is if you don't want less for a happy ending, then fucking watch the boy in the striped pajamas. And that's about as, about as real of an ending, I think, of, in what Jack would consider a realistic ending. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and the other thing I'll say is, you know, you, you bring up Spielberg. Uh, the only war film that my grandfather found any merit to was um, Saving Private Ryan. Mm -hmm. And that was the first 20 minutes yep. uh, right on the beaches of Normandy. But that's what, now, Spielberg, that's what Spielberg does best, action, you know? Right. And that was, now my grandpa, he was in the Pacific, He, but... That was the only movie war flick that he ever went to the theater to see. And uh, I was not with him, but my uncle had taken him. And my grandpa never said a word about the fucking movie for weeks. And then finally had said that was the first time he had ever seen, you know, unlike a John Wayne flick or something like that. Yeah. Where it, it was just exactly how it was. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I mean, I I would think that he did a good job of recreating it, you know. 
Uh, what's strange is when people try, when movie people try to recreate stuff, they usually get it all wrong. And I was talking to a guy who was in Vietnam. And I said, what movie should I watch if I want to see what it was like to be in Vietnam? He said, well, he said, most people would say platoon. He said, but that's more like you're standing there watching Vietnam. If you want to know what it was like to be go go through Vietnam from inside your head, mm -hmm. then it's apocalypse now. Mm -hmm. That that's the way it felt. And it's funny that it took a person like Francis Ford Coppola, who never spent a minute in Vietnam, was not a Vietnam vet, to get it right. You know, but he I think he saw what it was like from in somebody's head and as as you know it's taken from an old story that uh, has nothing to do with vietnam the heart of darkness the heart of darkness uh about a uh, uh, is it a colonel kurtz in that case too or is it a is he a military or is he in in, in heart of darkness but anyway uh, it, it, he made a, uh, you know, a real good document about Vietnam. It felt like Vietnam, most vets have told me. Yes, Patrick. London, I was told, and I've been told the same thing with that, but uh, Hamburger Hill. Uh-huh. Uh, that, that, that was it, it, very similar to the beginning was of... That, was that Sam uh, Fuller? Right. Was that Sam Fuller? But he's... Uh, um, uh, no, I think Hamburger Hill. I don't think was Clint Eastwood. No, was it? it was not Clint Eastwood. It, it was, there. but it was about it's a true story, and it basically battle from the beginning to the end. And there's another one where there's no happy ending on it. It it just it ends at the end of the battle and at the end of it. And um, and I've been told that that's about as realistic of a Vietnam flick for being in the battle itself. Um, oh, John, 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 uh, John Ir Irvin is the director, and Don Cheadle was in it, Michael Boatman. These are actors, for the most part, I never heard of before. Dylan McDermott was in it. It's a fairly recent film, it must be. Uh, what year? Oh, it, 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 87. It, yeah, I was going to say, it came out <laughs> in the Vietnam era. Um, yeah. Films. I don't know. The name sounded like something Samuel Fuller did, but yeah, uh, yeah. Jeez, yeah, amazing. Yeah, J Jeff. Yeah, I was going to say Schindler's List had been written many years before the movie. Yeah, was, was even owned. Right. Uh, and I don't remember it ever being a very good book. And I think I read it yeah. first, yeah, which was probably ten years before. Well, what and I, I think what, the movie what, was much, much better. What I loved uh, was uh, version of it was that Spielberg said, uh, you know, it was really hard for me to make Schindler's List because I really discovered what it was like to become be a Jew. And I'm thinking to myself, your fucking name is Spielberg. You know, you went to school and nobody called you a dirty Jew. Come on. You know what kind of what kind of just miasma did you live in where you didn't know what it was like to be a Jew and all of a sudden you get really Jewish mainly because you marry a shiksa wife and she converts you know and so you learn about <laughs> Judaism from the wife who's converting. I like that. You know it, who we did That's divorce. The best way to who, learn. Who we did divorce was Amy Irving, who uh, was an Orthodox Jew. And he apparently never learned about being Jewish from her, you know. So I mean, I've I, I, I've often I've often felt that uh, 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 Spielberg's a great movie maker. He's he's really a. Uh, if I had to show people a perfect movie, okay, somebody said to me. Well, I'm a movie student. What, let me see a movie that'll show me how to make movies. I'd say go watch India. Uh, go watch uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm -hmm. I said it's the most perfect motion picture ever made. I mean, there's not a missed note in that whole film. 
You can't find a bad moment in that film. There's not a bad shot. There's not a bad, uh, you know, <laughs> not bad dial. It's perfect. Go see that film. That's what he does best. But no, he wants to get the win the Academy Award. He wants to get respect. Uh, how can I do it doing these kinds of pictures? Well, you know, you were really great at it. You know, he's finally, Spielberg's finally going to do a DC movie. He's going to do a comic book movie. So we'll see how that turns out. Yeah. Uh, about, uh, about five, six years ago, I went to see my friends, my friends in uh, Buenos Aires. Yeah. And uh, I went to see the old synagogue. Yeah. which is a, a quite an interesting uh, architectural building mm -hmm. uh, because I think it was built in, uh, I don't know, 100 years old or something like yeah. that. Uh, but I don't know if anybody remembers that that synagogue was pretty much closed, or I would say the door was locked because a bunch of people from the Middle East came there and killed a whole bunch of people at that synagogue. Wow. Uh, and I got to go there, and it was difficult to get in. I mean, they had a gun, a guy, you know, a police guy mm -hmm. with a pistol, mm -hmm. and he goes, all right, uh, who are you? Why do you want to be here? What are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And then he says, all right, wait outside. And they went in and talked to the rabbi. And, uh, Chris, my friend Carlos, who lived there, yeah, uh, he says he used to go to a lot of bar mitzvahs when he was 13. Yeah. There, even though he's a Catholic guy. Uh, so we got uh, an interesting tour and a discussion with the rabbi and, and uh, and I always felt that, uh, you know, here, here's the thing that you're talking about, World War II yeah. and, and, the, and the people being killed and whatever. Yeah. It's still going on. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, it still goes and on. So, I often, I used to have a joke, uh, some people took umbrage at it, but I said, uh, you know, uh, the Hitler tried to kill the Jews, and back in Spain uh, during the... Uh, uh, the Dark Ages, they uh, they had the Inquisition, and they were torturing mm -hmm. Jews. Um, I, I said, uh, you know, it, it, it just brings to mind, and now in the Middle East, all that's going on with the with the Muslims hating the Jews. I said, could it be we're doing something to piss people off? <laughs> <laughs> and, and people go, on purpose. How, how can you say <laughs> that? And I go, well, you know, introspection's very important. <laughs> You know, I mean, maybe maybe yeah. it's just some way we're we're hit, just hitting people the wrong way. Because I, when I was growing up as a kid, you know, I could never understand. Number one, I was always like, all Jews are rich. Well, my father wasn't. OK, apparently I got a chance to be part of those Jews who didn't have money. All right. So I, I never liked that particular uh, uh, description of Jews. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, oh, in, in high school, I was always a dirty Jew. I mean, I bathed regularly. I don't think I was dirtier than anybody else, you know. And, I mean, I grew up I seeing that there was, a, there was a general dislike towards Jews. And I could never figure out why. Because it was just something that was, like, inherited, it, it, Kids heard from their parents, and their parents heard from their parents, you know. But I could never figure it out. I mean, what do we ever do? You know, basically, we're good at like uh, tap dancing and telling jokes and uh, entertaining you. Shouldn't you love us? You know, and yet, as a people, I mean, blacks want to talk about being hated. They were ju they were used as a economic commodity in the South. Jews have always been hated and exterminated and so on throughout history. Even the blacks hate the Jews. Anyway, <laughs> yes, who, uh, who had their hand up there? Uh, yes, Don. <laughs> well, you say, I, I grew up uh, Roman Catholic, and um, uh, I, uh, 
I never really encountered anything, or at least my, my parents never, I remember never really saying anything one way or another. I remember when we, we went to Philadelphia, uh, they had um, uh, a big do a guy who was a tailor and he made suits for us. And, and, uh, and then one day he gave us matzah and I go, wow, this is great. This t- tastes much better than what those Catholics serve, you know. <laughs> so I never really, I never really thought my, my parents or at least, you know, had any kind of anti-Jewish feelings until many years later. And um, I, uh, I, my father was dying of asbestosis and I was asking how his, he's a part of the, the lawsuit and uh, you know the class action suit, and I said, "Well, how's the class action suit?" So he says, "Oh, I got my Jew lawyer working on it." I go, "Whoa!" It's like that's the first time I actually. And then in the same visit, he started talking about that Taylor and saying very disparaging things about him as a, as an ethical person. And I go, "God, I yeah." Well, it's just never, it, it, I, it was a shock to me to hear my to hear my father saying things that are that are. Well, and I it, it just so happens that uh, Donald Trump has a Jew lawyer. Yeah. By the name of Cohn, right? Uh, yeah. So, so, you know, uh, 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 yikes is right, you know. Every now and then a Jew <laughs> does something and I go, oh, please don't. Oh, please don't. We got enough problems as it is already. Please don't. Yes, Patrick. <laughs> I, I was raised Roman Catholic as well, and, and I in I went to Catholic uh, grade school. Yeah, and uh, we were taught that the Christ killers were the Romans. Oh, really? I mean, Good. I'm glad that I'm glad that they're taking the the, the the Jews for it now. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we were we were told that you know you would you would the Jew Jewish uh, high priest that um, you know they they made vision but ultimately it was Rome and you know so we never had any um, we were never taught anything that was negative about Judaism yeah. and it, it translated all the way because uh, I went incidentally to a Catholic uh, university which yeah. I went to Cardinal Stritch University is the name of it well that sounds I, like a Catholic now, university to me well, yeah, but you know what? I didn't know. And again, I went to eight years of Catholic grade school. I didn't know what the fuck Cardinal, it didn't register with me until I'm sitting there one day and I'm looking at this painting mm-hmm. of this Pope looking guy and it said Cardinal Stritch. And it finally dawned on me that he was a Cardinal in the Catholic Church. So yeah. I had no fucking clue about it. But anyway, I took a couple of religion classes and there were required and it was the same thing uh there was nothing disparaging and and we learned you know a bit about judaism and one of my favorite teachers um she was jewish and the reason that i knew she was jewish Mm -hmm. in every fucking class she would tell us she was a jew (laughs) in some way or another it would come out that she jewish this that it became almost like a punchline to me really (laughs) Yeah. Why would yeah. you keep telling you she was Jewish? I, I I think the same reason a lot of vegans have to tell you they're vegan. <laughs> I think it was just something with her that she just every class you know, huh. some objection she had. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not a vegan, so I won't tell you that I am. Uh, yes, Tom. Yeah. Well, we're actually while we're on the subject of of, of, of Catholicism. I want to get back to the, the Garfine uh, uh, yeah. interview because he did mention some things in this last interview. He mentioned about the poll, yeah. Uh, you know, actually being doing something good, yeah. And I remember, you know, that from my history that the, the Pope was was not really, you know, uh, he was sort of complacent. Mm-hmm. Last week's interview, he was actually talking about. Uh, these priests being collaborators of the Nazis. Yeah, and well, he, uh, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. But you can't blame that on the Pope, you know, no, you because. No, can't blame that on the Pope. But yeah. I was just curious because he was actually, he uh, Jack said he wanted to actually get this 
communicate with, with Pope Francis regarding this situation where, I'm trying to remember the exact story, was that they were actually assisting the Nazis to, you know, to imprison. I think uh, uh, when I ate with him on, uh, when we ate on, uh, on s Sunday, he mentioned, who did he mention that he was trying to get a, a letter to? Was it, no, I, I don't, gee, I'm trying to remember. Huh? Yeah, he said uh, about trying to talk, yeah, talk I, to I don't, I don't think he, I don't think he was trying to send a letter to the Pope. Although I, I mean, he may have asked me, does the Pope have email? I think that was it. And uh, you have He's to, you, you have to write it. He's on Twitter. <laughs> Is he on Twitter? Yeah, but He's you have to. I think you have to write the Pope. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the truth about America was is that America was keeping Jews from immigrating here who were trying to escape persecution in Germany. I mean, if America had allowed enough Jews to immigrate into this country, they could have saved maybe a million lives, but they didn't. And now we're doing the same things to Syrians, you know. Right. Um, what is with us? You know, uh, we, we think of ourselves as good people, and we do the worst possible shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. So anyway, um, uh, what else? What, what's happening in the news? We haven't even gotten to the news. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see here. Trump uh, had the, uh, the what, prime minister of Japan in today, and he had him come down to Mar-a-Lago. Right, you know, same which, as before. I think he has people go to Mar-a-Lago and has meetings at Mar-a-Lago when he needs to make money for Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> do you get that feeling that, that he goes, well, uh, the profits are down this week at Mar-a-Lago. Let's have the Japanese prime minister come there. Then the government will pay for everything going on there for a couple of days. Well, it's either that or the chocolate cake. Well, you know, the, in in Trump Tower, <laughs> yeah, in, in, Trump, in Trump Tower, he was charging the government like an amazing amount of money to take up a couple of rooms on one of the floors to protect him. Mm -hmm. So the government finally decided we don't want to pay this kind of fucking rent. So they decided to live in the trailer on the street, <laughs> you know, uh, and and have their offices out of there. I mean, it seems like if I get the feeling that if Donald Trump didn't become president, he'd be bankrupt by now. Probably. He'd, be, he'd have so many creditors at his door. I mean, because while he's president, you can't sue him for anything. You know? So. Oh, I just thought of something. Oh, I just thought of something that I wanted to, to ask you about. The, the news about Sean Hannity. Well, um, yeah, I, uh, you know. I hate Sean Hannity. Hannity <laughs> and I have had bad words with each other, okay? But uh, I think they're making too big a deal out of the fact of him being a lawyer for uh, Sky Cohn being a lawyer for Hannity. Uh, and I was listening to uh, Jack's show last night with Amy. And Amy went, well, you know, there's only one reason why someone would hire Cohn, and that's because he's trying to get himself out of some problem with a woman. And I was about ready to call up and say, shut the fuck up, Amy. You know, that's a horrible assertion to make when you don't have any proof to back it up and only your own assumptions to back <laughs> it up. Um, I, he claims that the only thing he ever did with Cohn was uh, he helped him with some, uh, uh, some legal advice on real estate. Uh, I'll take him at his word on that. You know, I, and um, if he didn't have an affair with somebody and he was having a problem and there had to be a payoff, uh, I'm not going to necessarily hold that against him. You know, we don't know what the situation was, if that was the situation. But just because this guy was always a fixer, he may have been a fixer on any different levels. And so I, I'm a little kinder to Sean Hannity in this deal because everybody wants to make assumptions. Well, one thing, and I, I was surprised you didn't bring this out, was he, he, he did not disclose that he had a relation all this this past week he was talking about Cohen 
and make rendering opinions, I doubt once offered that that uh, that he had you know that they had had some dealings with him. And isn't I mean isn't that uh, you know broadcast ethics of disclosure? It, it's like saying like if you were to bring on uh, your 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 you know Harry or Harvey or your or um, your your business manager yeah, yeah Gary to talk about to about talk about taxes and not say that that he's your business manager and he does your taxes that seems to be a, a real lapse of, of broadcast ethics doesn't it well it, you're talking about ethics and then you're talking about Sean Hannity uh, he is a broadcaster but he's he he by his own admission has said I am not a journalist. And so, therefore, that does give him a certain wide berth if he wants to. Uh, uh, the fact that he's on a broadcast news outfit would make you believe him to be a journalist, but he says he's not. He's a commentator. Yes, Patrick? Uh, I was watching, uh, I, I saw a small snippet. Alan Dershowitz uh, yes. to be on, on his show and um, had told Sean, um, I'm surprised you didn't disclose that you at least had a relationship with him because then none of this would be an issue. And I, I agree with Tom to a point with ethics, but I think more of just clearing the air um, just to get it out there that I know the guy and that would be it. Well, and he knows just, the guy because he's had him on his show. Right. Yeah. And, and that would be enough to, and maybe in Sean's mind, that was enough that he'd been on the show before, so therefore, yeah. I don't need to disclose that. I've also talked to him in the green room about XYZ, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, but I, I just, somehow I don't, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not one to throw Hannity to the wolves for this. I'll throw him to the wolves for any number of things. You know, and I will agree with him. He's not a journalist, uh, but uh, but I, I just think that in this particular case, we don't know the full depth of, of why he wound up being so-called considered represented by what's what's Cohn's first name? Uh, uh, Mark. Name John. Okay. Is it Mark? But uh, was it Michael? Michael Cohn. Michael. Cohn. Michael Cohn. Michael. Michael Cohn. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, Michael Cohn considered that he was representing Sean Hannity uh, as, as to what it might have been something very minor. And he just considered that I was he was representing him. Uh, but if he was just a friend, and you called him up and said, hey, what do you think of this particular deal? Should I do it or not do it? Or is it kosher? What's happening here? Uh, and and it he really uh, if if you want him to be your lawyer or to give lawyerly advice and consider him a client, he has to give you at least one dollar. You've heard that old thing. It's the dollar factor. Uh, if a lawyer says, okay, I, I'm, give me a dollar. Okay, now I'm your lawyer. Well, then from then on, he can consider himself your lawyer. I don't know if money ever passed hands there, and neither does Amy, you know, and she doesn't know what for. And I thought it was in terrible taste last night for her to be smirched. Hannity with that uh, uh, paint as it were, uh, uh, to uh, go after him for who he is, which is a fucking slime bag who uh, I've done battle with from time to time. Um, th that's a different story altogether, you know. Yes. Uh, yeah, somebody had his hand up. Who? Yeah, it was me. Yeah. I, I think that uh, he... He kind of answered a little bit information, but very little information. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he was had a, a legal relationship, but maybe he didn't. And yeah, I think I gave him ten dollars. But they, you know, that's kind of like the answer. I think I gave him ten dollars. Well, you know, well, what's so that the mean? question you is, know, what does that mean? Yeah, but How the question is, why should Sean Hannity have to answer any of that? Well, he, because. He's trying because my uh, my guess, yeah. and that's all I can. Is I think that there's more about whatever happened between him and uh, Cone 
on yeah. some kind of a deal yeah. that yeah. he helped them on, he solved the problem or whatever, and based upon his recommendations, mm -hmm. something happened. Well, here comes and he, he, he doesn't want anybody. To here, know here comes it. Tim, who can't call the rest of the show, but he heard something where he can jump in with some <laughs> kind of uh, uh, conspiracy theory. Go ahead, Tim. Well, I had we had company that just left a few minutes ago, so I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Um, my, my, you notice that uh, Sean Hannity said. I might have given him ten bucks, but I've been reading some law blogs, and you can you could represent somebody pro bono, so there doesn't have to be exchange or a billing, but you can't rep represent somebody pro bogus if you're doing if you want an illegal device or on illeg illegal activities. And Michael Cohn is extremely entangled into people that have. Yes, but that, but that but that doesn't mean it doesn't York mean that Sean Hannity was one of them. That's what I'm saying. You can't infer that. No, no but show the but, proof. But he's also he's also connected with Victoria's Tensing and De Genova, De, De, Gen De Genova. So he's connected those attorneys too that were going to work for for Trump. So here's my conspiracy theory for the night because mm. I know you needed one. Yeah, no, you by need one, but. Sean, go ahead. By Sean Hannity getting involved yeah. and saying, I might have material in these documents that were absconded by the FBI, he can bring up First Amendment rights and just entangle them in going after all these millions of documents and saying which ones can and can't be used. I just, I just think they just, I think he's coming to Trump's, uh, He's coming to help Trump, and I just—I don't think he probably ever had any kind of representation. I think they talked about law like you would if you had a friend that was an attorney, but I don't think no. that there's any client yes. relationship. Uh, there, uh, so. uh, uh, Tom, yeah, well, that the, the problem is that that uh, that Cohen was arguing that that uh, that that uh, Hannity was one of his clients. He's only has. Three clients. <laughs> but that's just for the last two or three years. Uh, what clients did he have for the 20 years before well, that? Kind of, they have 30 it, years of documents. It's kind of like what's his name in The Godfather. The lawyer in The Godfather says, I have one qu client who likes to get his news uh, promptly. Uh, but hey, did you hear that he, uh, the Cohen offered uh, Nikki Haley $130,000 to go find another job? No, I don't. No, 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 but really, I'm sure you she's did. She's an embarrassment now too. I'm sure you did. The uh, um, uh, the other story today was the uh, Karen. What's her name? McDougal is her name. The uh, playmate who fell in love with Trump and had an affair with him for nine months. Uh, the case by the National Enquirer against her has been dropped, and she's free to tell her story to anybody who wants to hear it. You didn't. Oh, but she's got to pay him ten percent. No, she doesn't have to she's pay. She's got to pay ten percent of up to a maximum of seventy five thousand mm. dollars if she makes money on her story. It, it was a settlement. Uh, it, it, I don't think it was a settlement. I think that the uh, National Enquirer said they were not going to go after her. That's all they said. It was just their they, decision. They don't want to. I did not hear. I did not hear that there was any paper that crossed hands or whatever. And that she's free now to tell the story because they don't intend to pursue the uh, uh, the agreement of uh, what she said. She only wound up getting about sixty thousand out of the uh, something like one hundred and thirty thousand or one hundred and fifty thousand they were going to give her. Uh, right. But that I think they didn't want to pursue it because they didn't want to have the whole government start pursuing stuff against them as a result of it. Now here's the other connection with American media. Isn't that who got the anthrax sent to them down in Florida? It was an AMI National Inquirer office. Remember that? Yeah, well, so right. what, what does that have to do with this situation? Well, it's all connected to the people that run this country and Giuliani, because Giuliani ended up buying that building to set up one of his Bio One firms. What building? The building in uh, I, I, it was, it was I think near, you've snuck a couple of conspiracy theories under the no, no, under no, the this, table this here while I fact. wasn't looking, uh, and we only allow you one a night, you know. Well, this is because I missed last night, but 
But uh, the oh, I see. No, they don't. They don't. They don't. Uh, you, you, they don't gather interest uh, when you don't do them. Okay. If you don't come on a night, you if you don't use it, you lose it. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't have rollover minutes. <laughs> you don't have. We don't okay. have Bennett and Gabnet rollover minutes. No, none of that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, mm. uh, yes, uh, Jeff. Uh, my understanding about pro bono. Yeah. Uh, after uh, doing a little legal reference here. Well, pro bono is something that Cher wasn't. Well, pro bono is for people who are poor who can't afford it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be. There's no requirement. Well, there's no requirement as to how much money for pro bono, but pro bono is basically working for no fee at all. Yeah. You, know. you might do it for fame. Uh, yeah. There's also work on a contingency, too. You know I mean, so if you're suing somebody, the lawyer only gets paid if you if you have actually get some way in. Yeah. 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 Uh, but uh, and, uh, it, most, most, uh, most lawyers I know don't work under either. They want their money now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, I, hey, hey, Alex, I looked that up on the, in the New York Daily News. It is a settlement for McDougal, and American Media is entitled up to $75,000 of any profits. Uh, of any profits of what she sells? From her story. Yeah. I guess that's fair. Because it, and she it, keeps the original 150. So they're splitting it down the middle. So much. yes, uh, okay. So that 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 would I would I would consider that fair, wouldn't you? I mean, after yeah. all, they yeah, they but, paid her for the story. They never used it, which is a, a an old scheme. I can't remember what they call it now. Uh, but, catch and kill. Uh, catch, catch and catch and kill, in which you buy the story, then you kill it. Uh, so and, now it's now it's catch and release. Well, yeah, it, it is. Uh, but so I mean, but, it, you know why they, they it, did it, it because they don't want people digging in like Ronan Farrow digging into all the other catch and kills they've done over the years. Well, it depends There's on mind it, Well, it depends on who they've done the catch and kill for, you know. Uh, and I don't right. know that that even the National Enquirer likes to do catch and kill all the time. But on Trump's behalf, they probably do because there's a political advantage to doing so, you know. Who's worse, AMI or Sinclair? What do you think? Well, it, it, you know, I, it, it's two entirely different situations. Yeah, that's it's, true. It's, you know, one's I mean, national, one's local. No, right. no, it, it has nothing to do with national, local. One happens to be uh, a, a group of people who will buy a story to keep it from being printed, and a company that is just simply passing around bad news at local stations, and which people rely on to kind of be truthful. You know, I didn't mean the the process. I meant the end result of how they affect our. Well, I I think they're you know. both terrible. You know, however, I do enjoy the National Enquirer from time to time. <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, I like sci-fi. I like sci-fi. Well, no, no, they they don't do any of that. They have a second public. Well, they do alien. Don't they do alien no, stuff? No, once never, in a while? never. You see, that's where you're wrong. Well, Somebody said that tonight on. Uh, on MSNBC and was quickly corrected by a person on the show who said, no, that's the other publication they own. The Weekly World News does all the alien stuff. And the Weekly... Oh, okay, but it's, and, it's and I bet you, I bet you yeah. don't know how the Weekly World News got started or the reason it got started. And I will just tell you briefly, because I can say it very quickly and sign off at the same time. Watch me. I'm, I'm uh, going to do both at the same time. Uh, the Weekly Open World Esther. the Weekly World News was created when the National Enquirer, which was black and white at the time, decided to go to color, and so they want to had some had do something with their uh, their black and white presses, and rather than sell them, they put out the Weekly World News, which is in black yeah. and white. Okay, brilliant, yeah, absolutely yeah. brilliant. Uh, okay, anyway, hey, thank you everybody. First of all, thank you Tim for calling. Uh, Je Jeff, appreciate it. Patrick, I was going to send you a note and say, how was it in the hospital? But apparently you haven't gone yet, so good luck. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon, if not by the end of the week, or early next week. And, and Tom, I can always count on you when I say nobody's going to call. You yeah. always well, wind up calling. I'm actually going to be at a meeting tomorrow night, so hopefully uh, some, some, some other people will step up. Well, yeah, Phil will be back tomorrow night. But he's gone on, <laughs> on uh, 
Wait a minute. Oh no, he's no, he's not here again tomorrow night. Oh. He's not going to be on tomorrow night. So, yeah. so, so it's a good time for someone who's never called. You can get a word in edgewise. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, everybody. I wish you would all give yourself a, a big wave goodbye to the audience there, so they can see you. Thanks. I appreciate it. And that's our citizen panel for tonight. Uh, and we will do them again tomorrow night. Hopefully, tomorrow night we'll get. We've had very light days this week because everybody is like taking the uh, uh, the time off. Uh, Rob's on vacation. Mark, uh, Phil is doing some photo stuff, and uh, you know, so a uh, good time for the rest of you. As I say, is uh, uh, he was saying. For you to call and be part of the citizen panel. Anyway, that's it for me. I'll be back again. Uh, well, uh, next is Jack and Amy, and they got the intersection. Then at one o'clock, it's connections coming to you from Florida, and then tomorrow uh, uh, at uh, let's see here at at nine thirty, it'll be Damian Chaplin with the exchange, and I'll be back tomorrow night ten Eastern. In the meantime, same time, same station in life. In the meantime, as always, if you see her, yeah, tell her I love her, okay? Bye. Bye.